The Lord's Prayer, we've said, has got uh, six petitions um, broken up into two halves. The top half is God's agenda, the blue, and the orange is God's agenda for us. And um, we pray it for our benefit. When we pray, hallowed be your name, it kind of sounds like we're praying it for God's benefit. Um, He is to be glorified. But if we don't, the rocks will cry out. You know, it's like he doesn't need us. He doesn't need anything. He is all sufficient. Um, but when we pray, hallowed be your name, our perspective of who he is changes, and then everything around us um, changes with that. You know, so when the 12 spies went and checked out the land, and they came back and they gave a report, 10 of the 12 were like, hold on a second, those guys are giants. And you know what the scripture actually says? The way they report it back is like, we were like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And then they say, and in their eyes too. But it's like, this is how we saw ourselves. Why? Because they had a very small view of God. And two were like, no, hold on a second. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We're not on that page. Our God is much greater than them. Hallowed be your name. You know, when, when, when you pray, hallowed be your name, then the enemy, the giants, become the grasshoppers. We're not the grasshoppers. They're the grasshoppers. In, like, next to God, they're the grasshoppers. You see how it's helpful for us. And, and for us not to pray this prayer, we do ourselves a great disservice. So, your kingdom come is the focus of this morning. The next line in the prayer, it's got to do with the reign of God, His reign. We have said that this is a God-centered prayer from start to finish. And your kingdom come is his reign. As far as the dimensions of our lives as um, followers of Christ and as we walk with him, it's about citizenship and knowing who and what we belong to and that our home is not here. Even though we might love our house, we might love our suburb, we might love everything about where we live, why would you not with all these mountains and vineyards, and where the rugby is like poetry in motion. Sorry for all the Bulls supporters. That was, that was a great game. But this is not our home. This is not our home. If you think of this as your home, you're not thinking according to the way the Bible helps us to think about our home. Our, our home is heaven. We are citizens of God's kingdom. We are citizens of heaven. If there was a passport, an eternal passport, it would read heaven. So your kingdom come, we recognize the fact that God is a great and glorious king. God's kingdom, by definition, is the realm of his domain. Our surrender to the Holy Spirit, our trusting and turning to Jesus and our living our lives in obedience to the will of God is an expression of us understanding his realm of his domain and that he reigns over everything. And when we see him for who he is, then there's a response that happens in our hearts. So this is a very important subject. If we think of kings in ancient times, I don't know if we really understand kingship, but if you look at it in ancient times, a king was someone who had supreme rule. Whatever the king said, went. There was no going against, there was no like negotiating, there was no, hey, what about? The king's rule was supreme, and his rule was um, confined to the boundaries of his kingdom. And where his boundaries ended, there was a a new kingdom, and then that king had supreme rule over his domain. But then we read in Psalm 47, it says, Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. You see, God has no boundaries. So when I say his domain, there's no boundaries to it. It's the realm of his domain, but there are no boundaries. And he answers to no one. 
and no other kingdom poses a threat. You know, like you could have kings with their kingdoms, but the neighbors were always like, Ooh, we've got to watch ourselves, yeah? I mean, that's still true today, you know? We're the boundary lines of our country, and we want a little bit of your country. We want to extend our country. It's like this threat. Not the case with God. He's the king over all the earth. There is no threat that comes to him. Adrian Caper, Abraham Caper, sorry, wrote the following. There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. It's all his. And so kingship is a, it, it's, it's not the easiest thing for us to understand. And the kingdom of God is even more mysterious than the concept of kings in a kind of a natural sense, because it's so other. And I love the story of um, Pilate interacting with Jesus. And I mean, often when we read about the crucifixion, and I did it this week, I just read it in John, just like, you know, as things unfolded. Our focus is normally on the crucifixion, and that Jesus is about to die. But I was reading it through the lens of king, trying to understand, because the debate that they're having is about kingship. So, like, Pilate is, hey, I'm king of this turf, but actually the great king is Julius Caesar. So I'm like, I've got delegated authority here, but, okay, so I understand Julius Caesar. Who's Jesus Christ? Who, who are you? You claim to be the king of the Jews. You, your people don't seem to think that that's true. Who are you? And, and he couldn't make sense of it because of more than one reason. It, it, like, it's not tangible. Where's your kingdom? There was a, a non-material reality to this. And so he's engaging with Jesus because like, he's got this role of you know, kind of bringing the charge and, and um, saying you know, what the outcome is going to be. But he's trying to understand, like, who are you really? You claim to be king, but where is your kingdom? And, and, and so how does this all work? Very mysterious. Jesus says the following in John 18. In his asking, Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world. And then a little bit further down, he says, but my kingdom is not from this world. I can imagine that that didn't help Pilate's cause to understand it any better. But you see, what Jesus is saying is, my, my kingdom is in this world because I'm here, but it's not of this world. My, my kingdom's in the world because I'm here, but it's not from this world. It's wholly other. It's, it's coming from outside. It's not from here, it's from outside. The fact that I have come as king, my kingdom is not from here, it, it's from another place. And, and it's in here, but it's not of here. So you're trying to make sense of kingship with your filter of what king means and kingdom means, you're not going to be able to do it like that. Because my kingdom, it's different. So different. And I suppose the mystery of God's kingdom is where it is established. And so primarily it is established in hearts when we come to a place of surrender and we actually call him Lord. And so that's part of Pilate's problem. I can't see it. Where's the army? You know, where's your palace? No, it's happening in hearts. That's why you can't see it. And, and it, it's got like a secondary flow because once it's happening in your hearts, it starts to kind of make its way into your hands. So you start to see some of it, but it's still hard to really know exactly. It's got expression, but it's not this tangible thing. So God's kingdom and a framework for this morning can be um, broken up into three things. It's beginning, it's advancing, and it's coming. That's the inauguration of the kingdom of God. That's the progression of the kingdom of God. And that's the consummation of the kingdom of God. When we pray, your kingdom come, we're praying those three things. It, it, I mean, it can be more than that. I'm just saying the, 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 the gist of what we're praying is for God's kingdom to start in hearts. To, so like the unsaved, we want your kingdom to begin in the hearts of people who don't yet know you. We're praying that God's kingdom grows in the hearts of those who do know you. 
like it actually it becomes more of a reality. And then we're praying that it comes to a complete fullness. Because there's a, a now reality and a not yet reality to God's kingdom. So we're praying for that day when it comes to absolute completion and fullness. So if we look at the beginning, this is where we, we're praying for those who don't know God, and we're praying for those who are blind to the good news of God, to the good news of the gospel. They are blind to it. They don't know it. They are dead to it. It's not something that they have an appreciation for. And when you don't have an appreciation for what the good news of God is, but you are seeing something of um, an expression, we've got to make sure that that expression that's on display actually reflects the gospel. Because if we're reflecting something else and people are being exposed to something else, then they have a very skewed version of what the kingdom of God is. And, and it's very unattractive and very unconvincing. So this is typically what I think unbelievers think that us who believe, like how we believe and what we believe. And it looks something like a, a timeline of your life. So there's earth and, and, and there's me on the earth and I live this timeline from the day that I get born till the day I die. And, uh, you know, it, it's filled with ups and downs. You know, there's, there's some happy moments in my life and there's some tragic moments in my life. And, but actually, my, my moral behavior and how I live is what's really key as to what happens at the end of my life. And so if I'm above the line and, and, and there's good in my behavior and, and something of a purity and a holiness, well, then God will be happy with me. And the, and the destination will be heaven. And if I'm on the bottom end of things and I'm below the line, well then, oops. You know, and we can only hope for the best, right? So if you ask someone who's unsaved, do you think you're going to heaven? The response is generally kind of like with their fingers crossed. Hopefully, you know, if I do enough. Well, how would you ever know if you've done enough? I mean, just in case you think that that is the story of Christianity, we won't um, ask for hands to be put in the air. Um, that's not what Christianity is. That, that's not the message of the gospel. You see, like if we're thinking above the line needs to outweigh below the line, and at the end of my life, if above the line is more than below the line, then I'm good. Or if at the time of my death I happen to be above the line, you know, that's the other weird way of thinking about things. Um, let, let me not be, um, you know, taken at a time where I'm below the line. Because in that moment, there's trouble. I mean, you're relating to what I'm saying? Like, people think that way? We've maybe had some of those thoughts ourselves. And we, we've kind of grown up in ways where we thought that way. And hopefully with God's Word being opened up for us, we started to realize that's not right. Um, if you think like that, here's, here's where the problem lies. If you think like that, and, and you happen to think you're above the line, well, what does that mean? That's self-righteousness, which puts you below the line. It's like, you, you can't win when you think like this. You get what I'm saying? You know, it's like arrogant self-righteousness. How are you doing on this journey? No, I'm good. I'm above the line. Like... A, how do you know as far as assessing things go? Like, who, who's really doing the measuring here? And B, how would you know if you've actually done enough? And C, if you think you're above the line, well, well then you're just self-righteous. And, and I mean, God's quite clear about what he thinks of self-righteousness in Scripture, so we don't want to go there. If you're below the line and you think you're below the line, well, what does that mean for you? Well, it's just despair. You live in despair. And, 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 and a great level of despondency because, like, I'm just not measuring up. I love that word that Belinda brought because sometimes we, we live in a way where we, we disqualify our lives by our actions and our thoughts, and actually the gospel allows us to, despite those feelings and thoughts, to still be a part of his kingdom. Yeah. We're still a citizen. That hasn't changed. So th this view is me-centered. It, we need to have a Jesus-centered view. Can, can I just say, the Bible is not about you. 
It's not. Don't read it like that. The Bible was written for you, but it wasn't written about you. It was written about God, God's love, God's redemptive plan, how God's made it possible for you to be in His plan. It's about God. It's, it's not my story, it's God's story. We're jumping in. Like think, think of it like a river that's been flowing for a long time. It, it, it started before we were born. It's going to continue after we die. We're just jumping in on this story. But it's not my story. I'm not walking my line here. <laughs> but I'm getting in on God's story, and so what is His story? It's not about my behavior. It's about His activity. Stop thinking about your behavior. Because when you do and you think about his activity, your behavior will change anyway. That's how Scripture teaches us. You don't think about your moral compass. Think about the work of the cross and you live differently as a result. So let's look at what the story of the Bible is. I'm going to try and show it to you visually. So here's two spheres. God's space and our space. And in the beginning, Genesis 1 and 2, those two spaces were together. So God created heaven and earth. Okay? Then sin came into the mix, and the fallenness of man created this. So now we don't have this perfect union of heaven and earth. Now we've got God's space and our space, and they're separate. And then with time, God puts things into, um, into place where Jesus becomes the fulfillment of his plan all along where heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven comes to earth. And in this place of overlap, we see the reality of the cross. So the cross of Christ is what allows heaven to come to earth. Because the reason for the separation is sin, so we need a remedy for sin. And just like the sacrificial um, animals in the Old Testament would be kind of like this symbol of absorbing the sin of the people, they would take the sins people and it would be put on the sacrificed animal, which would leave the, the people atoned for. They would be cleansed. And as a result of them being cleansed, they could be in the presence of God, in the tabernacle, and then it became the temple. And So this presence of God on earth is heaven coming to earth. So which direction are we moving here? Is it me on earth making my way to God? No. It's Him making His way to me. The direction is the complete opposite of what we think. It's not this linear progression where I'm making my way to Him and hopefully I'm doing it well enough. If you think like that, you'll be mad in your head. You'll go mad. I mean, you'll torture yourself. That's what Martin Luther did. I mean, he was torturing himself until he read Revelation 1, verse 17. A righteousness from God, not my own. He kept confessing his sin, and when he was finished with his confession, he would go back to his chamber, and before he got to his chamber, he was like, oh, and there's that other thing, and he would go back. Tortured. And the Reformation started when he had this great revelation. It's not my righteousness. It's a righteousness from God. Jesus came. Heaven came. He came to dwell. That's the new tabernacle. That's the new temple. That's the sacrifice. Makes it possible. And then there's this ongoing progression. Where as we turn to God and as we put our faith in Him, we become citizens of this kingdom. And we are the light of the world. We are the salt. We are on mission. And as we move into the rest of this world, this earth, that's full of gunk. It's full of evil, full of sin. It's hell on earth. That's what's happening here. Now, the, the creation account doesn't say that God created hell. It just said He created heaven and earth. By our seizing autonomy from God and saying, I want to rule my own life. We introduced and allowed evil to reign. And sin and evil reigns in the rest of the space, but this progression continues. And when we read about the end and when Jesus comes again, then what happens is those two spaces become one again. 
That's the story of the Bible. It's one story. Perfection, Genesis 1 and 2. Separation from Genesis 3 through to Malachi 4. Incarnation, the Gospels. From Acts through to the Epistles, transformation. Revelation, consummation of all things. That's it. So why do we see ourselves on earth walking a line towards God? We're not. He came to us. That's the kingdom of God. So if we look at perfection, that's where it started, perfect fellowship, then separation. That's allowing evil to reign. But we allowed it. And so there is something of an expression of evil and wickedness and sin that rules this world, which is why it's a different kingdom. It's the kingdom of darkness. And God's kingdom is a kingdom of light. And this darkness is the world that we live in. It's why we have what we have. You know, as amazing as life can be, there are things that happen in this world that we just can't fathom. It's like, how did that happen? Well, it's because evil is still reigning in people's hearts. James says an amazing thing. He's talking about gossip and um, in his letter. And, and he's talking about what it means to gossip and, and just what happens. And, and he uses this phrase, the tongue is, is itself set on fire by hell. <laughs> God, I love James. Like he's not beating around the bush here. It's like, what? When I gossip? Yeah, hell. Yeah, it's lit. It's, it's like it's been made alive to everything but the things of God. It's evil. It's wickedness. I think, Let me think twice about gossiping again. Everyone okay? Do you see why it's so important for us to realize it's not how I'm doing? Because you're always not doing okay. But when we realize that God has made his way to us, well, then he has atoned for everything, everything that we do that's wrong. And so um, the Old Testament is showing something of this Jesus who is going to be coming, and it's pointing to him. It's, it's a lot of picture language and symbolism, but all the leaders, you know, Abraham and Joshua, um, I mean, Jesus is the greater Moses. He is the greater Joshua. All the kings, David, he's the greater David. All the um, judges, the champions of justice and the champions of, like, Jesus is our champion. So everything that's in the Old Testament, the tabernacle, the temple, that's why Jesus refers to himself as those things. I came to dwell among you. That's the tabernacle. You don't need the tent with the Holy of Holies. I'm here. I'm the temple. When he spoke about it being broken down and he will rebuild it in three days, he wasn't talking about the temple building. He was talking about himself. In three days, I will rise again. All the animal sacrifices, everything was wrapped up in the fulfillment of him coming. And in him coming, he made it possible for this kingdom of heaven to invade the kingdom of this earth. So if we look at incarnation, in the overlap, it's displacing the evil. So wherever the kingdom of God goes, it doesn't share its space. It moves in a way where it's pushing it out. And that's a clue for us because that's ultimately what God wants to do. He wants to heal his world and get the hell out of it. He, do he does. And that's the end result. No more hell. No more sin. No more evil. And when I say no more hell, I don't mean that there won't be a hell. I'm just saying it won't be on his space. It will be pushed out. It will be moved to an outer darkness. But it's not going to take any of his earth that he created for his glory. And so he's moving in a way where he's pushing this out. So the incarnation allows that to happen. If we look at Mark 1, it says, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaimed the good news of God. The time has come. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. 
The kingdom of heaven has come near. This is what's happened. The time for it has come. It was separate, but the time has come. The kingdom of heaven is here, and it is near, and it requires a response from you. So when we realize that God's kingdom has come, and we get to respond in repentance and faith, that we become a part of that kingdom. In John 3, Jesus has another interesting conversation with a guy by the name of Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is asking, how do I see the kingdom of God? And Jesus says this, truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. You see, by nature, we want our own kingdoms. We want to rule and reign over our own lives. If you don't agree with that, let's just have a conversation about how money flows in your wallet. To know who, like, who must make the decisions here? Who's ruling and reigning over my finances? Is God or is it me? Now, you might be a lot better than I am, but that, that's a wrestle for me. And sometimes I feel like, yeah, you know, I've like given it over, I'm surrendered, and then there's other times where, like, oh, I don't know, that's going to be hard. So we, we want the rule and reign. We want to call the shots of our own lives. But actually, it's about surrendering to the lordship of Jesus, the kingship, the one who is ruling and reigning already. It's just about whether we are surrendering to that or not. And so in order for that to happen, we need a fundamental shift in our inner person. And Jesus talks about it in a way where he he likens it to birth. You need to be born again. Like there is a new creation that needs to be made. Because if you're relying on your old creation, you're not going to be able to do this. And and so everyone gets the fact that you can't birth yourself. Right? You know, like nine months, I think I'm ready. I'm just going to make my way out of this. No, you are birthed. Like it, it gets done to you. Someone else carries the weight of that pregnancy. Someone else bears the pain of that pregnancy. Someone else gives birth to you. It's not something you do. It's something that gets done to you. And Jesus speaks in this way because he's helping us to understand we don't get onto this line and then by our behavior become new creations. We we come to a place of, of realizing who he is. He has come to me. The kingdom of God has come my way. I have a revelation because it's been proclaimed. The good news has been, re- been, been proclaimed. And now I'm, I'm responding to it because I realize I'm sinful. There's hell on my tongue. There's a wickedness about me. There's sinfulness. And if God is intent on getting rid, rid of the hell on this earth, well, b- best I not be one of those. I need to get rid of this. I need to look to him. Because he's made it possible. He is the the sacrifice that has absorbed all of my sin. And so I look to him as my savior and I put my faith in him and I'm no longer turning to my old ways and my old life. I'm turning to him in repentance and I'm believing him. And as I do that, I come into his kingdom and now I am a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. So now that I've become a citizen, it's about an advancing reality. The kingdom of God is advancing. Praying the Lord's Prayer and praying your kingdom come is firstly that it will begin in the hearts of people. That people will come to this realization, a revelation of who God is and the good news of the gospel and through repentance and faith, believe Him. We're praying for that. But now, because we are citizens, we need to live like a citizen. I mean, you can't be adopted into royalty and then act like something else. So you're a child of the king. And so we get to live differently because of it. And this is how Jesus explains how it works. In Mark 4, he says, again, he said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. You see, it's a permeating reality. It can start as a small seed but it starts to make its way in every aspect of your life. You know, so sometimes someone can get saved, and we're like, yo, but the language, just give it a chance. There's permeating happening here. 
It's just a seed that's been planted in this person's heart. Their citizenship is changed, which means their status is new, but their state is needing work, just like you and me. Our status is a citizen of heaven. That's our status. It's changed. We are no longer a citizen of the kingdom of darkness. We are now citizens of His glorious kingdom, His glorious light. But there is work that's being done on all of us. In 2 Corinthians 3, Paul talks about it as well. We're being transformed from one degree of glory to the next as we behold Him. And then he says, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is so key in us growing in this reality, the advancing of God's kingdom in our lives. And the reason why I say that is that you can't, you can't do this in your ability. This is a um, supernatural work that needs to happen, not a natural um, intention, not a natural, let me give it my best shot. A supernatural work that needs to come from outside of you where the Holy Spirit witnesses with your spirit does a work in you. I mean, if you just think about how Jesus described the kingdom, the laws of the kingdom is all about love, humility, sacrifice, self-denial, persistent obedience, unrelenting forgiveness. How are you doing? If you're doing it in your own strength, you're not going to get any of that right. The only way you forgive is with the Holy Spirit enabling you. The, the kingdom of God is countercultural. This is what Jesus, I mean, he says it in various different ways, but this is what it comes down to. The way to rise higher is to go lower. The way to lead is to serve. The way to receive is to give. The way to come first is to come last. The way to win is actually to lose. How are you doing? You can't do this. Do you know why? <laughs> I'm saying it's so important for us to pray, your kingdom come, that this advancing reality in my life, if I don't commit it to prayer, and I'm going to think I can do this in my own strength, you're in trouble. And I'm speaking from experience here. While I'm relying on God, and He's enabling power in me, and the Holy Spirit doing a work where this permeating reality starts to creep into my finances, and creep into my, my, my relationships, and I love people, and, and I forgive people, and I, and I extend grace, that is a supernatural work that's happening on an ongoing basis. And the reason why that's also so important is that it be, whatever's happening inside has an impact outside. I mean, this is the transformation. God comes, and He comes to earth, and there's this incredible um, overlap that takes place. But then He says, go into the world. We're on mission. You be the salt. You be the light. You, you go on mission, and, and we become these pockets of grace. In a fallen world where, where hell is being pushed out the whole time. And so we are advancing the kingdom of God by the work that is permeating in us. So your kingdom come, I'm praying that this life would have more of your rule and your reign. That everything about me is set by your agenda and your rule, not me ruling my life. You've put your seed of the kingdom in my heart, and I want it to permeate through every reality of my life. Knowing that when that's the case, I am in a position to actually advance the kingdom where you are actually advancing your kingdom, but through me. And so others get to see. Others get to hear. And do you see how the prayer that went before of asking for people to come to a, a place of knowing Jesus, that their hearts get filled with the kingdom of God and that they become citizens of heaven, you start to become the answer to the very prayer that you just prayed. And when you pray for people, and there's actual names, people who don't know Jesus, when you're truly praying for their salvation... And you're praying that your kingdom come in their lives. And you're praying for your kingdom to come in your life for the sake of their life. Trust me, you are probably going to be the person that God's going to use for them to come to salvation. He, he can do it, however. But I, I really feel like there's a, an answer to our prayer where we become part of the answer. Your kingdom come. And then it ends with the coming of the kingdom. Now, this is an, an eternal dimension that is so huge, and, and we need to get the reality of this. 
Because we have a window of opportunity. There is a day coming where heaven and earth will become one again and hell will be outside. Now we, we try and soften these things or, or we elect not to give it thought. But when you pray, your kingdom come, the coming of your kingdom, we're actually praying for a hastening speed, the coming. Now, I don't know how that works because God's already decided on the day. But Scripture also tells us that we speed the day by our prayers. So we don't have to understand it. We just believe it. That's a position of faith. But when that happens, three things will take place. The consummation of all things. Jesus will conquer all his enemies. Jesus will judge the world. And Jesus will be with his people. We read about it in 1 Corinthians 15. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. He will destroy every enemy. You know, he gave us a sample of it when he came here. How he stilled the storm. In the kingdom of Jesus, where he rules and reigns, there is no natural disasters. He just gave us a sample of it. This is what I do when I still the storm. I rule over the earth. All the natural elements. It's mine. He's just giving us a little bit, a little bit of a picture of what's coming. No more natural disasters. When he fed the hungry, in his kingdom, when he comes, there will be no more lack. You will not lack a thing. In any way or form. He healed the sick. There will be no more illness. There will be no more disease. See, he's pushing it all out. He cast out demons. There will be no more evil. And he, rose, uh, he, he raised people from the dead. And he himself rose from the dead. Which means there will be no more death. He'll deal with all of the enemies. And he will judge Revelation 11, I'm just going to go to verse 18. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. You see the three things that, that Jesus is going to do? He's going to judge those who haven't entered his kingdom. It's those who have resisted the witness of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever read about the unforgivable sin? The unforgivable sin is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What that means is when the message of the gospel gets proclaimed and the, and the um, witness of God is unfolding, as, as a potential recipient of it, if I resist that, I'm blaspheming the Holy Spirit which means I'm still living with my sin, which is why it's the unforgivable sin. There's not another thing there. It's like, oh, if I do this, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. It's not the unforgivable sin. The unforgivable sin is those who have not responded to the message of good news. And there is a judgment that's going to happen at the coming of Jesus. He's going to reward those, is the second thing it says. So if you are a follower of Christ and you are in the kingdom, you're not facing judgment of sin. That's already happened. Jesus took that. You're on the other side of that judgment. What you get at the coming of Jesus is a reward ceremony for how you lived your life from a place of salvation. And he will destroy the devil and his demons and cast them out. <laughs> your kingdom come. Do you see how powerful this prayer is? That we get to pray those things. May it begin in people's hearts. May it advance in our lives. And may you come back again. That you will deal with all of this. You will set things right. And heaven and earth will once again be one. And the doors of this world will be closed. And the gates of the celestial city will be opened. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come.